Hello, I'm Tom Rothman of 20th Century Fox. Welcome to Fox Legacy. We're happy to have you with us. Listen to the advice of your bigger, wiser, and more experienced brother. Man is like a banana, strong and firm, bright and phallic, and he's protected by his all-important shield. But when a woman comes along, you know, she sees this bright phallic beast and she wants it, but she's not happy with it the way it is. She wants to see what's inside. So she starts to peel away the all-important shield. First, she wants to see your romantic side. Then she wants to see your passionate side. Then she wants to see your soft, caring, feminine side. And she keeps peeling and peeling until you're left there, buck naked, totally exposed, with your balls blowing in the wind. I hold very few tenets sacred in the film business, where I found that conventional wisdom can kill you dead in the wink of an eye. But one that I do believe with devotion is an adage of my own devising. Audiences, I think, do not care how much a movie costs to make. They care how it makes them feel. I think I have some experience in this matter, being the only person ever to have run production at a pure independent movie company, a major studio, and a specialty arm of a major, which I'll explain to you in a minute. I have also lived the coincidence of having worked on both the most expensive movie ever made by 20th Century Fox, Titanic, and the least expensive one, tonight's offering, Eddie Burns, The Brothers McMullen. This film was the first film by this exceptional writer, director, actor, and poet of the modern urban working class landscape. And it was also the first film ever released by the now giant of contemporary indie cinema, Fox Searchlight. The film's success then, and its continuing ability to delight now with its so real insight into cross-generational ethnic upbringing, sibling relationships, and the modern love lies of its struggling characters is, I think, proof positive that if a film touches an audience emotionally, that audience will accept the film on its own terms, regardless of the compromises that may have been made to produce it. And back in 1994, before the advent of the digital revolution, before HD video or YouTube even existed, those compromises were many. But then, as now, the film business is the ultimate meritocracy. It's why I love it so much. You see, artists possessed of three things will be heard. One, talent. Two, a story to tell. And three, determination. Edward Burns, from a family full of New York City cops. His father and uncle were cops, seven cousins are cops, and three more are married to cops, and not a filmmaker among them. But Ed had, and by the way, retains, those three qualities in abundance. Determination being the prerequisite for entry. In 1995, Edward Burns was a dead broke PA, working for the TV show Entertainment Tonight, living on peanut butter sandwiches, because he couldn't afford jelly, in a cockroach-infested New York City apartment, while he wrote a screenplay he believed in called The Brothers McMullen. Following the old adage, write what you know, Ed wrote about an Irish-American family. Did you go to Dublin for this? He explored issues of Catholic guilt. An abortion? You can't have an abortion. That's against everything I believe in. Fidelity. You missed the Ten Commandments, right? How bad a sin is adultery? In commitment. Hey, I just don't think this is the right time for me to get involved in a serious relationship. And why is that? Because as a big time director, you can't be tied down? But he also knew that he was going to have to film what he knew. And his lack of money meant he was going to shoot using locations that were accessible and free. So he centered the movie in his boyhood home and other houses and apartments where his friends lived and where he wouldn't have to pay a location fee. He placed many scenes outside to work around the fact that he couldn't afford lighting equipment and could use natural light. And if two characters had to go on a date, dinner, a movie? No, not in this movie. In this movie, they go to the park because it's free. Nice date anyway. Well, let, let me ask you another semi-personal question. Well, you can ask it, but I can't guarantee you're going to get an answer. When it was time to make the movie, Burns needed at least some money 
So he raised funds from his father, someone who always believed in him passionately, and a family friend. I think it was in the ballpark of around $18,000, just barely enough to get film stock, something we call short ends, meaning the small segments of unexposed film on reels left over from other productions, which are sold at discount. And he certainly couldn't afford to pay his actors, so he offered deferred salary and lunch, courtesy of his mother's home cooking. He placed an ad and received 1,500 headshots. In the end, he cast himself and his girlfriend at the time, Maxine Bonds, in part because he knew at least the two of them would always show up for work. Now, Ed didn't have money for makeup, costumes, or set designs. Everything you see in the movie was exactly the way it was. To me, all the better, perhaps, when you're trying to create a real slice of life, real locations, real relationships, even real beer. Now, typically, a movie is shot over consecutive weeks or months. But for McMullen, Burns had to shoot whenever he could bring his ragtag team together. In the end, he shot about 18 different days over the course of eight months. To give you a little comparison, Titanic, by the way, shot for 160 consecutive days. Ed might start shooting a scene and then finish shooting it weeks later. So as a result, he didn't have the luxury of what we call continuity where you have someone on the set responsible for making sure that every set matches and people look or dress the same in each scene. We have someone here doing that for me now, making sure I'm sitting when I'm supposed to and standing when I'm not. Burns had to forgo all that. So you'll see there are a few unexplained wardrobe and hairstyle changes in the movie. But for me, somehow, it all adds to the movie's handmade charm. Now, during filming, Ed didn't use the traditional technique we call coverage, where you shoot a scene from different angles, and then once it's covered, the film goes into an editing room and you cut the scene together. Instead, Ed edited the entire movie on paper before he started shooting, so he only shot exactly what he envisioned and often used only one or two takes because that was all the film he could afford. Ultimately, Burns assembled the movie by sneaking into the video room in Entertainment Tonight, but... Working two shifts eventually took his toll. He was actually working with an E.T. crew to cover an interview of Jodie Foster for one of our movies, Nell, actually, and he fell dead asleep in Jodie's bed. But Ed persevered and submitted McMullen to various distribution companies and festivals and was rejected everywhere. Many said that the film wasn't edgy enough for an indie market then transformed by the success of Pulp Fiction. Here is where I enter the story. In 1994, I had an idea. One of the few good ones I ever had. It was new for the time. It was the idea of creating a division of a major studio that would have the distribution resources of a big company, but the risky, inventive, low-budget aesthetic of independent films. At the time, I was working for the Samuel Goldwyn Company, which was one of the premier independent companies, and so I knew a bit about what that aesthetic was. Even with that, I couldn't get a meeting anywhere. In fact, only Peter Chern and Fox, of all the studios I tried, was willing to give me the 15 minutes I asked for to pitch this idea. I guess everyone else must have shared the sentiment you will hear from the character of Patrick in this movie when he says, I don't need any new ideas. I'm confused enough already. Hey, hey, I don't need any new ideas, all right? I'm confused enough already. And Peter Turner not only gave me the meeting, but being the entrepreneur that he is, he gave me the go-ahead. And so was born Fox Searchlight, a company that combines the very best of independent and major studio filmmaking. Searchlight was the first of these companies, and in my deeply biased opinion, remains the best bringing you such pictures as Sideways, Little Miss Sunshine, Boys Don't Cry, Bend It Like Beckham, Garden State. And now, well into its second decade of existence, over a hundred others, including its first film to gross over $100 million at the domestic box office, Juno. But Searchlight's very first movie was the one you'll see tonight. We saw it then in very rough form, and although it had been passed on by every company in the business, we gave Ed a little money to finish it so that it could be shown on 35 millimeter. Helped get it accepted to the Sundance Film Festival. Then, as now, the mecca of American indie film. 
And when the movie received a rapturous reception at Sundance and won the grand jury prize in the 1995 Sundance Festival, the brothers McMullen, Ed Burns, and Fox Searchlight were all on their way. So sit back, forgive a few costume miscues, and delight in the best depiction of modern male Irish American experience you will find on film for any price, anywhere. After all, only someone who lived it could write that father's line, shut your mouth when you're talking to me. And afterwards, I'll be back to tell you just why it was that this little film ended up at Fox Searchlight. Have fun. When you work for a movie company of any kind, size, or shape, I don't care, one of the occupational hazards of that work is that you are constantly being given scripts or pitches or half-completed films from friends or relatives or friends of relatives, friends' relatives. I've even been stopped by a cop late at night outside my home and, rather than being arrested, been handed a script he wrote. And 99% of all of these submissions have one thing in common. They stink. Because of the three things I said at the outset one needed to make it in the movies, talent is the hardest to come by. But talent is also the hardest to kill. It will out. And it's why I love the movies. Why it's still vibrant and fascinating to me after 25 years. And why Edward Burns and all the future Ed Burns out there need to keep plugging away. In the early days of Searchlight, as we tried to sort through what movies we would make or wouldn't make, we got sent every possible script or film that had been rejected by any existing company anywhere on Earth. And buried deep in that pile somewhere was a tape of unedited scenes of the Brothers McMullen. And it might have stayed there, too. Except that Ed's dad, relative, was a friend of David Evans, an executive at that time at Fox that I greatly admired. And David asked me to please look at the tape. And I remember well, late on a Sunday night, feeling burdened and tired, but having promised David, putting the tape in my VCR back then, and thinking I'd watch 10 minutes. But I didn't. I watched it all. And lo and behold, what I thought I saw was something special. Comedy that came from truth. If I masturbated as much as I wanted to, <laughs> I swear to God, I would live in a constant state of guilt. Emotion that came from reality. And something the very best movies have, a specificity that, ironically, leads to universality and broad relatability. I adored the characters, and I thought others would too. And so the next day, I called this fellow, Eddie Burns, who was lugging cable in Entertainment Tonight. I picked up the phone and I said to him the words that everyone longs to hear, but never does. I said, buddy, quit your day job. Since that call, Edward has written and directed seven films, starred in many more, including Saving Private Ryan and our own 27 Dresses, married a supermodel, had two kids of his own, and continues to have a great multi-dimensional career in the movie business. Why? Because one, it doesn't matter how much a movie costs, it matters how it makes you feel. And two, talent will out. So if you're sitting out there tonight thinking you can do it too, maybe you can. Just maybe you can. You know, when you find your... Your true companion. Stop, you stop right Jesus. there, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think we've all had enough true love talk to last us a fucking lifetime. For the Fox Movie Channel, I'm Tom Rothman. We'll see you next time. <laughs>